television, I mean, we're talking castration and rape and people being skinned alive. And you watch the Jason movies, and they're so quaint compared to that. <laughs> but at the time, critics like Roger Ebert said, you know, I mourn for our society. When, when I was a kid, we had, you know, beach blanket movies and, you know, but now, like, I didn't call it, the only thing a teenager can expect to do in a movie is die. All right, so I ask yourself, maybe why were teenagers worried about dying in the 80s? Factor of thermonuclear annihilation. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Living under that, that, the idea that at any moment there be, uh, the Soviet Union would press the button and we would be dead. We, well, I remember. Yeah. That. So, yeah. how many of you, my age or our age, I'm assuming, is from the, are familiar with the day after? Because yeah. that's definitely yeah. a horror film. And it, <laughs> a horrific, and it was the, one of those, it, you know. I can take all the Jasons and Freddies and, you know, leather faces or anything else you can throw at me, but the day after left me scarred. I mean, it was it was a movie that was broadcast on ABC, made for TV, that was about what hap what would happen after a nuclear holocaust. And it was terrifying. You know, it was it, it was just one of those things that, and, and, and I know there are other films like Threads and Britain and, and things like that that, you know, approach that topic, but it was so, I, I don't think people today understand how, prevalent it was to us that we could die at any time. Uh, in the 80s, we certainly felt that, that we, you know, we were, it, it really had reached its peak in the Cold War now. Nicholas Meyer directed the yeah. day after. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. yeah coming right off the of time after time in Star Trek. Do me the scariest freaking movie <laughs> ever made, and he did it for television. Yeah. Right, <laughs> absolutely. And I, I remember I was in middle school, high school in the 80s, and my family talked about like what would happen if nuclear would work, like where would we go, you know, to, to what point in the house where would we go, and you know, what would be there, and it's like you got Kansas soup there, and how long would you be there? I mean, th but these were not uncommon discussions for families to have at that point. I think by the end, uh, the point where uh, I was starting to get coherent around me and understanding geopolitics, my folks had already tuned out. They were, no, you're not going to live. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. You understand what a thermonuclear blast will do to this? You don't want it. Well, that's, I, I remember, I that's what my father said to me. He said, hey, you want to hope you're not one of the ones who said I can remember my friends, most of my friends even, them saying, if we find out that something's coming, we just better go as close to the bomb as we can so we can be obliterated right away. Right. So we don't have to live after right. this thermonuclear disaster. So, to bring that all the way back around to the slash report, which people found so unacceptable in the 80s, right? That it was so terrible. Well, why is it terrible? In, in those movies, we have people, the final girl, something like that, saying, I'm facing something horrible, and I'm going to figure out a way to survive. And I'm going to be resourceful enough, and clever enough, and strong enough, <laughs> well, that, that's true. We've gotten a little better with that. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe not quite as what we would call a sex positive thing today, but but it is a positive role model. So, I mean, again, if, if that's what the culture is consumed by, this idea that something, some boogeyman is going to kill us at any moment, you know, why are you going to have beach blanket bingos in the movie that, <laughs> that speaks to your generation? You're not. But the idea of surviving an experience with Jason or Freddy. What does Nancy say in Nightmare on Street? I'm into survival, right? When she's, and she, remember she creates all of those booby traps to stop Freddy. It's, it's the, again, I, I talked about in the 70s, the idea of horror movies for me are pro-social. They are about making our lives better, showing us the things we're afraid of and we're afraid to face that mainstream movies will not show to us. And I mean, you cannot see that more clearly than in these slasher movies with people so derided, the rubber reality, Freddy movies, those as well, that it's something you can fight and you have to stand fight because if you don't do it, who's going to do it? Yeah. Let's not mention that Siskel and Eber had a whole show of how warning people mm -hmm. not to go to the, you know, the party of 13 and all those. And then they had. Before they even seen it, they were panning and howling, dismissing it as a slasher movie. Right. And then they came back on and said, oh, we just seen this. It's not one of that, you know. Right. But they did give good reviews to Halloween 
and my house on the left. Right, right. But everything else, like I spit on your grave. Yeah. They called it disgusting. And right. I. And John Carpenter, in the reception to the thing, he said he was called a pornographer of violence. I mean, that's what was happening in this revolution culturally in the country, this realignment of politics, the rise of the moral majority, that people were comparing horror filmmakers to pornographers, right? Well, Roger Ebert was super good friends with Russ Myers. Very much for you, where you wrote? Beyond the Valley. 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 Beyond Okay, so all those things were happening in the 80s. Uh, yes. Yeah, this discussion of slashers and remembering the 80s. Uh, time of lines a bit fuzzy, but it seems to me this is when um, the, the, the more infamous serial killers became more commonly known to Americans. Mm -hmm. I think that little boy was killed down in Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, was he around in the 80s? No, he was the 90s. Right. Well, he was the 90s. Right, and, and you're talking about that movie, uh, which I believe was the 80s, but it wasn't Henry Portrait of a Serial? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Well, it was supposedly his buddy that killed the head of the kid down there. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So, so that was happening too? So, the transgressive cinema started to happen, which was really interesting stuff. And, and having met Michael Rooker several times, I can tell you he's not that guy in that movie, luckily. But the, he, he said that they just, it was just nihilistic. It was just what they felt at the time when they were making that film. That's just how they felt about the world. You know, and, and, and that's happened over and over again. You know, there are people like Greg Iraqi later who would make films that sort of said, we're just all, pardon my language, fucked. You know, that was kind of what the, 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 the purpose of the movie, what they felt like they were doing with the movie. Um, and, and to your point, I want to say, as we talked about this, this um, puritanism that took over in the early 80s, by the mid-80s, America was sort of moving into this extreme, this, this greed, this, and that came into the movies as well. And I, I think that was, the movies became more and more gory, more and more excessive. You know, we got Sam Raimi, we got Evil Dead, we, we started moving, you know, and, and then, you know, Stuart Gordon sees Evil Dead and says, well, I gotta outdo that, I'm gonna do Reanimator. And then that's what they were just trying to one up each other for so long. It, 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 but it, to me, and I asked Stuart Gordon about that, and he said, you know, I never really thought about it, but yeah, as the decade became more excessive, the films became more excessive. 